In today's video, we're going to talk about the basics of tunnel diodes, or you can call them the bucking bronco of the diode world. And we'll talk about what I mean by that term here in a moment. Uh, most diodes that we run across, whether they're rectifiers or switching diodes, that we've talked about diode switching in the past, or Zener diodes, or PIN diodes, or varactors, or even LEDs, they all share a common characteristic in that they generally you know, will conduct current in one direction, block it in the other. Of course, the Zener is an exception in that case, where it'll break down, but they all have that same basic IV characteristic. Now, the uh, tunnel diodes do not follow that same basic principle. Uh, the tunnel diodes were invented in the late 1950s by Leo Asaki, and there's some really good references uh, that I'll link in in the video notes down below. There's actually a lot of information online about tunnel diodes. Some of the original uh, data books and text and tutorials on tunnel diodes from uh, the late 50s and early 60s are all scanned and available online. Literally hundreds of pages where you can uh, go research the uh, theory and uh, details to your heart's content. So I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of tunnel diodes in this video talk about their characteristics and some of the basic applications. Those tunnel diodes don't have, as I said, the normal IV characteristic of an ordinary diode. In fact, they've got this very unusual IV characteristic that looks like this. They'll conduct in the reverse direction like a low value resistor, so they don't really block current in the reverse direction. Uh, so you can't think of them as a diode in that sense, but it is a diode because it's a PN junction. Uh, the really unique feature about the pin, uh, the tunnel diodes is this forward characteristic where you've got the, as the voltage across the diode is increased, the current increases so it behaves like a low value resistor at very low voltages. You reach a value of current called IP and all of a sudden uh, if you go, if you increase the voltage beyond that point, the current actually begins to fall and you have this kind of negative differential resistance region where the current falls with increasing uh, voltage. So that's kind of a negative resistance characteristic. And then you reach a valley voltage where beyond that increases in voltage will cause the current again to rise. So that portion of it looks a bit more like the regular diode characteristic, but in between here in this little region you've got this negative resistance characteristic. And this is the thing that can that gives the tunnel diode its unique characteristics and leads to the unique applications for a tunnel diode. Uh, the symbol for the tunnel diode is shown here. It looks uh, a bit like, almost like a Zener diode characteristic or even a Schottky, but the, both of these little legs are turned back towards the diode itself. So that's what the, the symbol or one of the symbols for a tunnel diode is. There's a couple that have been, uh, been used in the past, but that's the most common one that you'd run across. So this strange uh, IV characteristic that has kind of this buck or this hump in it is one of the reasons why I call this kind of the bucking bronco of diodes. It kind of bucks the trend of what a normal diode does with this kind of weird humping characteristic here. But this negative resistance region where the current is falling with increasing voltage is a very unstable region to operate in. and. Uh, you know, because it you know oftentimes result in positive feedback in a circuit and other things like that. So, uh, so we're going to see this can lead to some troubles with uh, with the diodes, but also leads to some interesting applications for the diodes. Now, this negative differential resistance or NDR region of the diode uh, makes it uh, even very tricky, uh, remarkably tricky. In fact, notoriously tricky and difficult to measure the IV characteristic because uh, the diode will tend to oscillate uh, when you hook it up in kind of just a normal kind of IV curve tracer type configuration. So um, you can still kind of get a measure of where the peak uh, current is and where the valley current is, but in this region you may not get exactly the shape because of the oscillation. So let's set this uh, very simple thing up here and take a look at that real quick. Okay, so I've got this uh, variable DC power supply set up here. Uh, who's sending its voltage essentially through the Simpson 260 on the 10 milliamp scale. So this is being used as an ammeter here to measure the current. Uh, then the, that comes out and goes through the diode and back to the power supply. And then so that'll monitor the current through the diode. And then this multimeter is set up across the diode to measure the voltage. Okay, so as I turn the uh, voltage up, we can see that the current is rising on the uh, Simpson meter over here, and we can see the voltage is rising. So if we get up to 
you know, right about mid scale here, there's 5 milliamps of forward current through the diode. You can see the diode sitting at about 33 millivolts, so we're kind of right on this uh, portion of the curve right here. If I keep turning the voltage up, okay, now we're up to about 60 millivolts or so forward voltage, running uh, close to about uh, 8 milliamps or so. Keep going up here, and watch what happens right here as I turn the voltage up a little bit further. We are sitting right now at about uh, 8.5 milliamps, about 90 millivolts. A little bit further increase in the voltage now. So now I can see I'm up to close to 200 millivolts or so on the diode. The current is falling, so we're walking our way down uh, this curve here now. If I keep increasing the voltage across the diode, we can see the current really dropped off here. And we're now at 373 millivolts. And we keep going, and uh, we can see now the current is coming back up again. So we went down through the valley, and now we're walking back up the other side of this curve. Now, uh, so that's kind of the traditional, you know, classic characteristic of a tunnel diode in terms of what the voltage and current relationship is. Now one thing you may have noticed when I was doing this is that even though I was bringing the voltage up very slowly and fairly linearly, the uh, current dropped off uh, pretty sharply right here. As I keep going up linearly, it dropped off very sharply again down there. And uh, that's kind of an indication that there's some oscillation going on. So instead of getting this really nice curve, we're reaching a point where it's you know dropping quickly and then kind of going shallow for a while, then dropping quickly again and then coming up. So uh, let's actually take a look at that by putting the scope probe on there. We can actually see what's going on. So now I've got the scope probe hooked up across the diode here, and we can take a look at what's going on across that diode as we sweep through this IV characteristic. So if we walk up uh, from zero voltage, start turning that diode voltage up, we can see the current rising linearly, everything's fine, the voltage is coming up linearly, it's coming up on the scope, no problem. We cross over the peak, get into that ne negative differential uh, current region, or negative differential resistance region, and we can actually see the oscillation on the scope. We can see that the current has dropped down, so we, we recognize it as a tunnel diode. As we keep walking our way down uh, towards the valley, we can see the uh, oscillations start to change, go to a high duty cycle, and then eventually go away. And then the voltage is just going up uh, normally on the far side of the diode characteristic. But uh, as soon as we bias, bias ourselves within that negative differential resistance region, we see this thing busting into oscillation. Now what that means is it would make it difficult to actually accurately measure this portion of the curve, but uh, if you just want to check to see if a tunnel diode is working right, you can kind of ignore the fact that you're not, you're not accurate in terms of where you're measuring this, but just the fact you can actually see that you know a dip in the current as the voltage is increased on the ammeter is sufficient to tell you that the uh, tunnel diode is working. And you can also tell as you're bringing the, uh, the voltage up, let me kind of work my way from zero again, as we bring the voltage up here, we can see that we clearly reach a peak uh, point where the current will kind of peak and then start dropping. And that would be essentially this point right here in the IV characteristic. Now it is possible to uh, surround the tunnel diode with you know, various components, resistors and capacitors and things like that, to stabilize this. But it turns out that the actual values that you need to surround this diode with are going to depend pretty highly on the particular diode characteristics. The slope of the negative differential resistance region of the diode, the capacitance of the diode, the current that it's operating at, all of these things are parameters that you have to take into account when designing the circuit that goes around this diode to keep it from busting into oscillation like this when you make the measurement. So for our purposes, it's not that important for us to kind of squelch that oscillation out, but just to recognize that we actually do have this basic shape as we increase the, uh, the voltage across the diode is enough to tell us that, hey, this is a, uh, a tunnel diode, and uh, that characteristic is, uh, indicates that the tunnel diode is still in operating condition. Of course, when these tunnel diodes were developed in the late 50s, early 60s, you know, semiconductors were still pretty new. And the speed at which these uh, diodes could traverse this negative differential resistance region was tremendously fast. Uh, you know, well, well under a nanosecond, uh, some of the fastest semiconductor devices available. So there was a lot of work that went into looking at ways of exploiting that characteristic. Um, so uh, 
uh, things like uh, there are you know various types of oscillator circuits, monostable and astable type switching circuits, uh, trigger circuits for oscilloscopes was a, was a big application, uh, logic circuits and things like that. And again, the references that are in the show notes uh, will have you know some of the data manuals for the tunnel diodes will have examples of different types of circuits. So we're just going to look at a couple here. So let's look at the operation of a simple relaxation oscillator. Um, we've got a voltage source here that we're going to bring up to about one and a half to two volts uh, and along with these resistors is going to bias the tunnel diode just past uh, the peak current. And uh, what happens as that voltage is coming up, uh, you know, that increase in voltage causes an increase in current, that, incre that, that positive DIDT causes a positive voltage to appear across the inductor. As that voltage crosses, or as the current crosses IP, as that voltage comes up, that current wants to start coming down in this series string. That change in slope of the current uh, is going to cause a, this inductor to react by trying to maintain that current flow. And by doing that, it basically slams the voltage all the way across over to the other side of the curve here very, very quickly. And uh, so as soon as that happens, now the, vol now the uh, voltage is higher than the voltage that would appear normally through because of this uh, voltage source. So the current starts coming down. As that current comes down, it reaches the valley point, and at, at which point you know, the, we start hitting that negative differential resistance again, and we get that same reaction for the inductor, but now in the opposite direction. That slams you back over to this side of the IV curve very quickly and then the uh, voltage starts rising and the process repeats and the thing just bounces around here. So let's take a look at that operation on the scope. Okay, so I've got my tunnel diode here, my little a couple of pair of resistors. I've got a 220 microhenry inductor here and uh, just uh, the oscilloscope probe is looking at the voltage across the inductor. So if we uh, start turning the voltage up, we'll reach the point where we uh, essentially cross into that negative differential resistance region and now I can actually see the oscillation here on the scope. You'll notice that as I move the uh, voltage up and down, uh, I can actually change the frequency and duty cycle of that oscillation. So it's pretty sensitive to that. But uh, we can actually see this behavior of this thing slamming, you know, from one, you know, one side of the curve to the other side of the curve back and forth, uh, just like we showed in the, uh, the IV diagram. Right, so this thing's oscillating you know, about 38 to 39 kilohertz or so and again is a little bit dependent on where I set the uh, the bias and uh, of course the frequency of oscillation is depending on a lot of things you know the bias is depending on the parasitic inductance and capacitance of my board and things like that here and the, the capacitance of the diode and things like that well, in fact if I uh, pop out this uh, 220 microhenry inductor and let's pop in about a 3.6 microhenry uh, uh, inductor here in its place. You can actually see the frequency has gotten uh, a whole lot faster as you'd expect. And if we turn that up here we can actually see that's running at about uh, two and a quarter megahertz by simply changing that inductor value. Now of course as I said this is going to depend a lot on diode characteristics and things like that in order to get a particular oscillation frequency. So one way to make it a bit more controlled and less dependent on the diode characteristics and the parasitics of the circuit is to simply uh, you know, replace just the inductor here with a tank circuit. Of course what I mean by that is simply you know, putting another a capacitor in parallel with the inductor here that will kind of dominate the, uh, the frequency characteristics. So I'm going to use that same 3.6 microhenry um, inductor and if we put a 6.8 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with that that tank circuit is going to result in a frequency of about one megahertz and because uh, the impedance of this is really only going to be high essentially at that one frequency we're going to take a lot of the other harmonic content of that oscillation that we see uh, out of the circuit and the oscillation that we see here will be uh, a bit more sinusoidal okay so let me pull out this uh, 3.6 uh, nano henry or 3.6 micro henry inductor I'm going to replace it with this, uh, basically the same type of inductor, but now with a, uh, uh, a 6.8 uh, nanofarad capacitor soldered in parallel with it. So now I can actually see the oscillation is a bit more sinusoidal. Of course, there's still some distortion in it, but a lot of the other harmonic content is gone. And now the, the oscillation is going to be less dependent on bias and less dependent on the diode.
Now this is an extremely simple oscillator, there's lots of ways to improve it, but it just shows that with just a, a, a small handful of components how easy it is to create an oscillator with, uh, with these tunnel diodes. Okay, so the last application circuit we'll consider here is a monostable trigger circuit. And this is uh, basically the application of how these diodes would be used in an old analog scope to um, essentially kick off the horizontal sweep on the, uh, the old analog scopes. Uh, if we set up a constant current source, and that's what this is, a constant current source that biases through this uh, inductor, biases the diode at a constant current level, okay, kind of indicated by this dotted line, we can see that that line crosses the IV characteristic in three spots. So you can say that the voltage that it, it appears across the diode could be one of these three voltages. Well, the reality is what we've kind of learned with the relaxation oscillator is that uh, because of the serious inductor that this spot would be unstable. So we're either going to be sitting here or here. So when we first turn the circuit on, you know, the diode starts from nothing, and as the current comes up, we're going to basically land at point number one. And uh, the way that this, uh, this trigger circuit works is that you provide a small input voltage, okay, a little input pulse that I'm going to do with uh, my little function generator that couples into uh, the bias of this diode. And just enough to push, you know, to push the voltage on the diode above, um, you know, past this point to essentially get ourselves up over the hill. <laughs> and then as soon as we cross over into the negative differential resistance region, the inductor is going to cause this, uh, the voltage to slam all the way over to point number two very quickly. And that's how the old analog scopes utilize this. That very fast rising edge going from this voltage to this voltage was used to kick off the sweep and the faster that edge was the less uh, jitter you'd have and the more stable trace you'd have for a given uh, trigger input. Okay so I've got that circuit set up on the lower half of the board here. I'm coupling, coupling in my uh, signal generator uh, to the uh, inductor at this point and I'm measuring the dial voltage with the probe here on the scope. If I flip on the, uh, the power supply to turn on the current source you can see the voltage across the diode jump oh, by 60 or 70 millivolts or so. When I hit the trigger button here, we can see that the diode voltage will switch from the low voltage state to the high voltage state on that IV curve. We need to take a single shot measurement to really kind of capture that edge. Okay, so let's uh, reset the tunnel diode to the low voltage state by turning off the current source and back on again. Put the soap scope in single shot mode and trigger it to capture one edge. Now with that one edge captured we can just quickly zoom right in and uh, see that, that uh, the bulk, the rising edge there is on the order of, let's see, it's a nanosecond per division, so it's a little bit under uh, one nanosecond. Now of course that's not taking into account uh, you know, any particular you know, layout here to really increase the speed. I'm using the really long leads on the diode and that kind of thing, so it's probably uh, you know, even faster than the sub nanosecond that we're seeing here, you know, even with this pretty crude uh, fixture that I've got put together. So uh, that's just one example of how uh, you could use the bistable nature of the uh, uh, diode characteristic here to create a fast edge from uh, a trigger source. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little tour of uh, tunnel diodes, what they are, what their characteristics are, and some of the applications. Again, I encourage you to take a look at some of the links that are in the video description. Uh, there's a couple of really good resources um, on uh, tunnel diodes. Uh, some of the original manuals that were written by GE and, and RCA uh, uh, covering uh, applications and theory and circuits and all that kind of thing. So, Anyway, thanks again for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Tell your friends and we'll see you next time. Thank you.